Hi, everyone, and welcome to History Lesson. If you're taking this class from home online, if you're here in person taking the class with me, please take a seat and we'll start momentarily. spoke about the important In today's class, we'll focus on geography, the only country in the world that has its shape on its flag. As always, we'll start with a short video followed by a short quiz. For those of you, please send me a group chat. For those of you here in person, fill out the answer sheets and leave those on your seats. I will pick them up as soon as you're all out of the room. Okay? History lesson number three. Geography is history. At the conclusion of this lesson, you will have developed a thorough understanding of the following terms. Island. Maps. Tragedy. Prehistory. The West. Archaeology. Island dwarfism. Here is a map of the world. We'll take a closer view of the Mediterranean Sea. In the east of the Mediterranean lies an island, the island of Cyprus. In this relief map of the island, you'll see its outstanding physical features the northern range of mountains, the southern range of mountains, and the central plain between them. We'll keep this picture still for you to look. If you look from the mountains onto the plain, you get a view like this. The island of Cyprus, madame, world famous for beauty and long tragic history, being conquered many times, conquered by Phoenicians, Assyrians, Persians, Macedonians, also conquered by Greeks, Romans, Byzantines, Turks, purchased from Turkey by your esteemed self, the British Empire. All Cyprus most fond of the British. Multiple geological surveys have confirmed that the island first rose from the sea 90 million years ago as two separate islands. All this was underwater. Other sources mentioned that Cyprus was in fact part of the continental mass of Asia. A piece of Anatolia lopped off. How do you, how do, you do this thing? shop where we make many beautiful things and we live upstairs. You like it, huh? <laughs> you still have a hand loom, huh? Everything is handmade. <laughs> still. Still. Still an island, Cyprus's geographic isolation has had many consequences. Some of the island's early inhabitants suffered those consequences firsthand. Pygmy elephants and pygmy hippos, their fossils showed that the animals shrank because the island was too small. These findings have caused a stir among the modern residents of the island, who are not aware of the possible side effects of island dwarfism on humans. Another geological feature that speaks to the island's history is the Rock of Aphrodite, 
were this lady seen bathing. Aphrodite, goddess of love and sex, emerged from the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, much like the island itself. To demonstrate the relevance of history to the present, consider these contemporary practices. Modern-day cults of Aphrodite, largely based in Russia, claim that the goddess still lives in the island's minerals. Some pay millions to rub themselves against the island's rocks, hoping that their supernatural power will make them rich and fertile. Question number one. What is an island? A. An island is a place for tourism. B. An island is a lonely land. Or C. An island is a map. Okay, that's A. An island. B. An island is a lonely land. An island is a map. Okay, moving on. Question number two. When did Cyprus first emerge? A. In 1960, the year of its independence. B. 19 million years ago, when it first came out of the water as two separate islands. Or C, 1974, when it was first divided. A, 1960, B, 19 million years ago, or C, 1974. Excuse me? Yeah? What is Cyprus again? teaching a course about a place that so few people know about. Very few people, in fact, including its own inhabitants. As the anecdote I just shared with you today demonstrates, it is very hard to pinpoint the exact location or relevance of the island of Cyprus to a student body, whether that is international or for this reason, I feel especially privileged to be sharing my research with you today at the annual historical conference of small, unimportant, or disappearing places here in New York City. And I welcome your feedback at the end of this talk. Today, I will be presenting a short analysis of my teaching methodology, which I have coined historical unlooking. Historical unlooking is the core component of my bespoke history lesson, which is based entirely on foreign films shot on the island of Cyprus before its division in 1974. Now, a big part of the problem that we face as educators and as historians is Cyprus's small size. It's smaller than the state of Connecticut. Its smallness is exaggerated by the island's tiny state. The layers of political intrigue, the remnants of conflict, the nationalist frameworks, and multiple contradicting histories on the island have had the paradoxical effect of turning it into a blank. To use a metaphor that my students find particularly compelling, Cyprus is a Google Maps location changed willy-nilly by everyone who wishes to control its narrative. One day it's there, the next, it's gone. So, what are we historians and teachers of history to do faced with this predicament? 
In my presentation today, I hope to show how my trademark historical unlooking technique can go a long way to fix this problem. You see, when certain types of events happen to a place, they have the capacity to rupture what we call history in a way that makes it impossible to see beyond them. They become black holes. They devour the memories that preceded them. This is the case with the military coup and the subsequent Turkish invasion that took place on Cyprus in July and August 1974. One of the most significant results of the 1974 events was the mass displacement and physical segregation of Greek and Turkish Cypriots along the so-called Green Line. The Greek Cypriots, in this map designated in orange, went south of the island, and the Turkish Cypriots, designated here in green, all fled north. And they couldn't move freely across the line until 2003, when some checkpoints were made. Now, the island's division, its cartographic representation of division, is manipulated visually for nationalistic purposes all the time. As a Greek Cypriot, I come from the south part of the island, where the image on the left is a standard government propaganda graphic. It reads, Zenxechno, I never forget, right? And you can see the north of the island dripping down with blood. The map on the right appropriates this same trope, but doesn't name any of the places in the north. It's like these places stop existing. It's like this map here forgot the admonition to never forget. Such forgetful cartographies are present in the north of the island as well, as you can see from these two maps. So imagine this. For those of us born after the division of the island, like myself, and we are fast becoming the biggest demographic on Cyprus, growing up, almost a fifth of the island residents were not available to talk to, and a third of the island's territory was totally closed off to us. But yet, we were still asked to never forget places that we'd never actually The only tools we had to remember were carefully selected images of the so-called other side, such as these photographs of the landmarks in the north of the island, which featured on the front of public school exercise books. Now, my mother's family is from the north. In fact, she's from the town of Valosi in Famagusta, which has been in the news lately um, for a number of devastating reasons. So you would have thought that my connection to the north of the island, my family ties to that part of the island, would have given me a visual education beyond these old school and, in fact, outdated exercise books. But here, I was doubly unlucky. You see, my mother's family photo albums, which her sister had the foresight at age 15 to take with her as they were fleeing the bombing of Famagusta. They burned in a house fire in 1993. There was a short circuit in their television set. The only image that we have from my mother's family life in the north is a photo of my uncle in a military uniform. This image was saved only because it was taken by my uncle's godfather, who lived in Marnica, a city in the south of the island. When my uncle went missing during the fighting in 1974, this was a photo that the family gave to the media and the authorities in the hopes of finding him. I remember growing up, my mother would watch the scene from uh, Michael Kagoyanis' documentary, Attila 74, which is about the events of that summer. And she would watch the scene on repeat. It 
a scene where busloads of uh, Greek Cypriot prisoners that were captured by the Turkish military return to the island, and their relatives are waiting for them. I don't quite know what my mother was expecting to find there. Perhaps a clue about her missing father. Perhaps she thought they'd somehow missed him, that he'd actually returned, but were lost in the crowd. How is that possible on an island of only a million people? Okay, settle down, settle down, please. If you're taking this class in person, you must adhere to the social distancing guidelines. Please keep a chair between the two of you. Please. Thank you. Sorry about that. For those of you at home, would you please turn on your cameras so that I'm able to look at your faces and see who's here and who's not? I have to take attendance. Okay, so today's class is called History Without People, and it's about the flora and fauna of Cyprus. This is an especially important class because Cyprus, like every other place in the world, is facing the effects of climate change more and more every year. Now, like the de facto division of the island, the domination, the de facto domination of the Anthropocene has totally distorted our historical perspective on the island. By focusing solely on its human inhabitants and their flora. propose in this class is that we look at every other being that lives and breathes on this island. What about all the other forms of life that stake a claim to Cyprus? As always, we'll watch a short video, which will be followed by a short test. And if any one of you at home has an issue with the sound, please wave and I'll make sure to try to fix it as the video is over. History lesson number five, human free history. At the conclusion of this lesson, you will have developed a thorough understanding of the following terms. Fauna, the Anthropocene, Cypriot, natural history, the East, natives, invasion, colonization, Cyprus is like a ring that has passed from hand to hand of changing empires. Phoenician, Greek, Roman, Egyptian, Venetian, Ottoman and British. You can't fight the whole British Empire with 600 people. It isn't possible. To define the term Cypriot is thus a controversial and exceedingly difficult endeavour, which encounters a number of scientific obstacles. Of the true people of Cyprus, we know nothing. The backdrop upon which people fleetingly exist, however, the island's flora and fauna, tells a much better and richer story. These are the Cypriots, and they've been here a long time. Cyprus is a sunny land. Notice what heavy shadows are cast by the hot sunshine. It's dry in the summer, and the land suffers from excessive heat. Only stubborn creatures survive in these conditions. Donkeys, for example, who have been central protagonists in the island's history.
Camels had a shorter run. Their association to places further east of Cyprus all but guaranteed their disappearance from a now proudly European island. Another such stubborn creature is the date palm, shown here. Fossil records show that the date palm has existed for at least 50 million years. Along with pygmy elephants and pygmy hippos, date palms can be considered the original Cypriots. Like Cypriots, we don't know where they came from and who they really belong to. Some sources claim that the date palm was brought to the island by the Ottomans in 1571. The tree is often found near mosques, but not exclusively. <laughs> This hypothesis finds a symmetry in the rotating cast of characters that have ruled the island over the centuries. Some say the Venetians brought the cypress tree. The British definitely brought the eucalyptus tree to drain the island swamps. This invasive species has now taken over vast expanses of the island, colonizing its natural habitat and threatening its native plant population. You see, invasion and colonization are far from just human problems on the island of Cyprus. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you tell us where Cyprus is again? A country, but also of a family, centers around never forgetting. One starts to wonder what you actually forget in order to not forget all those other things, people, and places you've been told to remember until you die. One thing we were forced to forget, and the education system systematically omitted, was any art historical knowledge of the island. Anything related to the arts gets secondary treatment at schools in Cyprus. And as Cyprus developed into a financial and banking hub, a laundromat, a passport issuing haven, the arts were even further discouraged. This might explain why I had no idea that foreign films were being shot on the island before 1974, with big, big Hollywood names like Paul Newman, Eva Marie Saint, and Peter Sellers. 
When I discovered these films, I must admit I was embarrassed. My ego was somehow hurt. After all, I'm an educator and a historian. I should have known about them. But at the same time, ego aside, I was very excited to find out about them. These films could help myself and my students unlook Cyprus as we've known it. Divided, prohibited, halved. The fact that the island was captured on camera in its pre-1974 state gives these films a different quality to any other source that we use in our current history books. Now, this is the same quality that makes the films excellent for a history lesson. A history lesson where time and space and narrative are reconceptualized according to cinematic principles. Now, at this point, you may be asking, what about local films? Local Cypriot cinema began slowly developing around the time of the country's independence, and no doubt these films are valuable resources too. But the foreignness of the selected films is critical for my pedagogy of looking. If we are to reset our vision, if we are to encourage our students to lose the filters that decades of nationalism and fanaticism have imposed on their vision, then we must return to the originary landscapes of Cyprus. And I define originary here not as a monolithic physical state of the island before divisions and nationalisms ravaged its map, its image, and its people. One way to do this is to turn to photographic documents and films that were very first shot on the island, those very first films and photos of Cyprus, which hold images of Cyprus as a whole. In the most part, these films and photos were made by foreigners. But there's another reason to my choice. For more than a century, the island has been enamored with every other nationality except its own. It is quite possible, then, that turning to other people's gaze as a very conscious pedagogical tool may be the only way for us to reclaim some sort of idea of a unitary Cypriot history. After all, Cypriots are united in the way that foreigners have represented us and our island for centuries. In any case, let's turn to some of the films that I'm referring to and see how they can help us unhook Cyprus. First, there's Exodus by Otto Kaminger, which can teach students about the Jewish internment camps on Cyprus in the late 1940s. But on a personal note, it uh, also showed me how my mother's hometown looks in the summer. Then there's The Wastrel by Michael Kagoyanis, which showed Cyprus as the Caribbean and can make students stop craving for exotic locations, since they apparently come from one. Then there's Sin, or The Beloved, starring Raquel Welch and, and directed, I'm sorry, by George Cosmatos, and this can teach students the lasting appeal of gender stereotypes. For example, that women only talk when they want sex. I should also mention, aside a research project of mine, that um, Sin, this film, also revealed to me the possibility that my missing uncle may have been an extra in the film, unbeknownst to his family. This is something I will continue working on and perhaps uh, will reapply to this conference to talk about in a few years' time. But um, from what my mother remembers, my uncle did fancy himself a bit of a jean premier. So perhaps this is an entirely implausible. Okay? There's Bloodsuckers, a very 
bad a vampire B movie by Robert Hartford Davis, and this film can help introduce students to histories of the supernatural on the island. Then there's Vacations on our Cyprus. The alternate title is Mr. George's Follies, a Greek production from 1973 that can show students how the Cypriot dialect has been offering constant comic relief to mainland Greek audiences for at least 50 years. And last but not least, there's Ghost in the Noonday Sun, a pirate movie featuring Peter Sellers that went straight to VHS. Now, the only reason I even find out about these films in the first place was because Ghost in the Noonday Sun has become the subject of a conspiracy theory regarding the events of 1974. The film was being shot, happened, and it was largely being shot on the northern coast of the island, where Turkish forces first landed. According to a Greek Cypriot parliament investigation, the film, I quote, was used as a smokescreen to help Turkey, end quote, prepare for the invasion. I quote again, What other reason could there be for shooting such an expensive film amid political unrest and conflict, and especially a film that would turn out to be a major flaw? End quote. Ultimately, there is no concrete information to corroborate these Having a failed film is hardly evidence of a spy operation. But if this film had a secret story, what other stories lay hidden in the films made on the island before 1974? If films are so influential to real life developments on the island, even if just in Cypriot's heads, why are we keeping them apart from so-called official history? My signature history lesson asks just those questions. And as a result, it creates a more robust, more accurate, and more equitable version of the modern history of Cyprus. This course, which has been fully redesigned for remote learning during the pandemic, comprises of a series of online videos and Instagram stories, which you can find on the course's dedicated Instagram site, at The Real History Lesson. The course also has its own custom design stationery. I, um, I've already contacted the Ministry of Education in Cyprus, in fact, to propose a trial run of these exercise books in public schools on the island. What we've done here is basically replace the existing photographs on the exercise books with stills from the films that I mentioned. This is remarkably easy because all of these films, or at least almost all of them, shot on location in these landmarks that are already featured on the exercise books. So replacing them is not a difficult job. This is yet another reason why these films that I'm proposing are perfectly capable of replacing current tools of history teaching. Okay, so, where was I? Um, my film, you had asked, why film? Cyprus is an island, yes. Cyprus is an island, but it is also a map. And as a map, it is also an image. And so it follows that as an image, it is also, to a large extent, a fiction. So studying other people's interests about Cyprus can help us have a much more all-rounded view of the island's history. But this isn't real history. <laughs> okay, um, Angie, the 
Africa um, is stating, I will repeat for those of you at home, that this isn't real history. Point taken, and I am happy you raised this point. Um, we, we want to talk about this as a class, uh, and I'm open to debating this. But, but before we do so, I want to ask you all, what do you think is real history? What makes history real? Science, facts, concrete information. Okay, science, facts, concrete information, absolutely. And no one can doubt. No one can that these films that are part of our curriculum are also facts. But I want us to be mindful of something that historians have known for a really long time. The passage of time can do strange things to facts. It can bend them, it can twist them, it can stretch them out of shape to the point that they become almost unrecognizable. Is it that? What fact should be more concrete, more stable, more solid than a geological fact, geology? What fact should be less ambiguous and more objective than the ground we stand on? In cyclists, even this fact is a subject of a fiction. According to geologists, Cyprus emerged right after the subduction of the African plate beneath the Eurasian plate. But there is a problem with this scientific interpretation of how the island came about. Because it doesn't quite jive with the proven fact of the island's first mammal inhabitants. According to scientists, some of Cyprus' first mammal inhabitants were pygmy elephants and pygmy hippos. Small elephants and small hippos. These animals are genetically linked to elephants and hippos from the Asian continent. Now, the question that science can't answer is this. How did these animals if the island emerged from the water and if these animals couldn't swim? Right? No concrete facts can deal with that paradox. Artists, artists and writers have tried to tackle it. For example, British modernist author Lawrence Darrow, who lived on the island in the 1950s, he claimed that Cyprus was in fact a piece of Anatolia lobbed off. This was corroborated by a Syrian cab driver who claimed to me a few years ago in Boston that Cyprus used to be a part of Syria. And he justified that by saying that the island's the, the nose of the island, the peninsula of Carpathia, fits perfectly into a groove in the Latakia coast in present-day Turkey. Now, out of all of these, what is the real history? Which are the concrete facts? There is one thing we know for certain. And that is the effect that geography had on these creatures, the effect that the island had on them. And that, my friends, is an indisputable fact, even though it sounds like fiction. Elephants and hippos got to the island, they were regularly sized, and then they shrank. Geography changed them. And this phenomenon is called island dwarfism, right? Now, okay, okay. I see a lot of hands popping up here. People are waving at me. The chat is on fire with questions. But please, 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 give me a few moments to pick my thoughts, and then I'll open this up for debate, okay? Now, what if, what if, Island 
dwarfism can affect human beings? What if it's evolved from a physical to a cognitive phenomenon? What if Cypriots are on the way to shrinking, both bodily and mentally? What if, what if the disappearing cartographies that I showed you, all those maps where place names just drop off and vanish, what if those aren't just political propaganda, but are the visualization of a collective amnesia? What if living on half of the island, like most Cypriots do, makes that amnesia even worse. Don't you see that if we are to remember the island before its division, if we want to have a good and solid idea of its history before division, we need these moving images that are present in the films that we're studying here today. These films are one of the rare and last remaining repositories of images of the island as a whole. Isn't that real history right there? And if that's the case, isn't it obvious that we should all make an effort to, to that we should all be thinking about the ways in which citizens that we are can um, um, isn't it obvious that we should all be thinking about sorry, this is embarrassing. Um, what if we God I'm sorry. What was I saying? 